Hi, uh, we went to the game. Uh, it's always a sad uh, time uh, when we meet uh, together to uh, commemorate uh, the memory of uh, Jacob Beckenstein, but uh, with time, uh, <coughs> it's always thankful. We, we remember him as a, as a dear friend and colleague. Uh, what I want to say is uh, that um, I think by the quality of the lectures uh, we get that uh, come here and help us uh, commemorate his memory, uh, we realize how good of a scientist uh, he was uh, if he had uh, such uh, comics that can come and, uh, uh, and give such a uh, distinguished uh, talk. So uh, let Barak uh, introduce uh, maybe say a few more words and introduce our speaker for today. Okay, hello everyone, it's good to see all of you. Uh, we are here to commemorate uh, our uh, distinguished colleague and friend, Jacob Beckenstein, in the annual lecture. Uh, when uh, Jacob passed away a uh, little over two years ago, the Raqqa Institute of Physics established a series of lectures in fundamental physics. So a student asked me what is fundamental physics. I think the definition is physics that has to do with the laws of nature, formulation or changes in the laws of nature. And this is already the third such lecture. <laughs> I'll tell you a bit about Beckenstein before introducing our speaker today. So uh, Jacob Beckenstein was born in Mexico City in 1947. And it's a, a typical story maybe of, of the Jewish people. The parents fled Eastern Europe, and he was born over there. As a teen, they moved to the US, first to Texas, then to New York, where he had a first degree. And then uh, he moved to Princeton, and that was a, a, a key point where he was joining the group of John Wheeler in Princeton that did a general relativity, studied Einstein's theory of gravity. And it was there that he uh, developed his idea about Lincoln entropy, which is his, his well-known achievement and uh, the basis for the field known as black hole thermodynamics and to various ideas about uh, quantum physics and gravity. And there also he met uh, Bill Andrew, as we will describe a little bit later. Uh, uh, after a postdoctoral position in Texas, he came to Israel uh, for a faculty position, first in Be'er Sheva, and then since 1990, he was here at the Hebrew uh, University. He won various uh, prizes for his achievements, the Israel Prize of 2005, the Wolf Prize of 2012, and the Einstein Prize of the American Physical Society of 2015. Uh, in my opinion, he was a model scientist. His keen intellect and deep thought enabled him to see further than his contemporaries. He always kept the focus on the physics especially in fundamental physics, always develop his ideas independently and originally. And that was coupled with a singular personal ethics, both scientific and personal integrity, and a lot of dedication. So those who, who knew him remember how he would really focus on the physics and he put everything else on the side. Uh, and with this, I would like to go over and uh, introduce our speaker today. We are fortunate to have William Unruh, known to all as Bill. Uh, he was born in Winnipeg, Canada. He did his undergraduate schooling over there. And for him also, the, uh, I think it, an important turning point was moving to Princeton, joining the group of John Wheeler uh, in 67. And after four years, in 71, he already graduated with a PhD. He's well known uh, for his studies on gravity, 
and especially quantum aspects, quantum fields incur space-time, cosmology, foundations of quantum mechanics, black holes, and especially is known for the effect that bears his name. This is the effect that tells us that a, a particle moving in curved space-time in constant acceleration and in the presence of a quantum field views the quantum fluctuations as a thermal bath whose temperature is proportional to the acceleration. And for this occasion, I found, I, I read parts of the original paper, so I want to read to you a couple of sentences from there so you see how clear it was already in the first paper. It is called Notes on Black Hole Evaporation. And the abstract says this paper examines various aspects of black hole evaporation. And then it says, an accelerated detector, even in flat space time, will detect particles in the vacuum. And after a certain equation, it says, this result is exactly what one would expect of a detector immersed in a thermal bath of temperature A over 2 pi, where A is the acceleration. So the temperature is proportional to the <coughs> acceleration. Uh, he won numerous prizes, I will mention a few of them. The Rutherford Medal from the Royal Society of Canada from 1982. The Herzberg Medal from the Canadian Association of Physicists, 1983. The Specie Prize from the National Research Council, 84. Canadian Association of Physicists Medal of Achievement, 95. And the Canada Council Killam Prize. He's also elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a fellow of the American Physical Society, a fellow of the Royal Society of London, and a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Science. So, as I told you, uh, Andrew and Beckins, I knew each other from their days in graduate school, and I checked they didn't have any paper together, but they had a lot of give and take along the years, and I expect uh, Bill will tell us more about it. Uh, from my point of view, I met Bill first uh, when I was in graduate school, that was in the 90s, and we more recently met him here in a happy occasion in 2012, where we celebrated 40 years of black hole dynamics, essentially 40 years for Jacob's uh, big discovery, and Bill was one of the persons who came, and it was a very uh, nice, moving, and scientific uh, uh, meeting. And uh, we're very happy that he came here today, so let's greeting with a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real honor and privilege to be here. I hope you can all hear me in the back. Good? Um, I, as said, I knew Jacob from way back when, when we were graduate students at Princeton. We were both students of John Wheeler. We didn't ever work together. He was a year behind me. Um, and so our interactions were slightly limited. Uh, one of the problems was, you know, at, at Princeton, one does general exams in the first two years. So you're sort of sitting somewhere in the library studying trying to learn all of physics so that you can pass these stupid exams. Um, and in the fourth year, I was sort of trying to interact with my supervisor, John Wheeler, and so I followed him around the United States. Uh, I spent about three months following him to various and sundry places and managed to speak to him a total of maybe six hours during that time. Um, so I wasn't at Princeton in that last year very much. But Jacob and I were interested in exactly the same kind of physics. Uh, we were interested in black holes and what's going on in black holes. And in, especially when Hawking's result came up, uh, our two paths uh, completely, in some sense, merged together with each other. And I would say that of all of Wheeler's students that I know, Jacob, in some ways, is closest in spirit to Wheeler. One of the amazing uh, abilities that Wheeler had was to come up with really good questions. Uh, very often, way out questions. 
he would often in his lifetime, people would look at him and say, mm, is he a bit nuts? And then 10 years later, five years later, everybody was working on exactly that topic. Well, Jacob had that ability as well, to go along unconventional ways, to come up with unconventional and, and interesting questions that one had to chase him in order to try and understand exactly what those questions meant. Um, his highest profile accomplishment, of course, was the whole black hole entropy uh, situation. And it really had no business working. As Bob Garosh pointed out in a colloquium that Bob gave, uh, he'd been talking to Jacob, black holes don't have a temperature. And if those things are going to have an entropy, a black hole would have to have a temperature. And it doesn't. Its temperature is zero. Things fall in, nothing ever comes out. So, you know, it was a nice idea. But then Hawking in 1974 published a paper which showed black holes have a temperature. It worked. And it was an amazing uh, result. I didn't always agree with all of his solutions and many of the questions that he looked at. But they were always things that made you think and made me think of, why do I feel this is wrong? And forced me to try and really clarify my thoughts on these matters. Uh, for example, one of the things that he did when he was trying to develop this idea that black holes had an entropy was to say that there was this entropy to energy ratio which had to be limited, which I always had trouble with. One of the things I have to point out is that that was incredibly important for example string theorists in developing the whole holography principle. I tend not to agree with that either, but then again, as I've said to Bob Wald sometimes, you know, sometimes it feels as though we're sort of in a minority. And he said to me, Bill, we're not in a minority. There's only the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Jacob is missed uh, for all of the above reasons. Well, what I want to talk about today is directly related to his interests, namely, how do black holes behave? I'm not going to talk about the entropy. I'm going to talk about that consequence of the entropy, namely the temperature. Black holes have to have a temperature. And what does that mean? Uh, and how can we test any of this stuff? And I will argue that, in fact, not only can it be, but it has been to some extent tested, not out there, which seems to be impossible, but in the laboratory. Let's have a look. One of the most amazing features of modern physics is the role of analogy, especially mathematical analogy. And it raises the sort of philosophical questions uh, what, how can we use analogies? Um, we find that many different systems in physics are described by the same mathematics. People have said, for example, that the only thing you need to know is the simple harmonic oscillator and the two-level system, and you can do all of modern physics. That's a little bit of an exaggeration. But it's less of an exaggeration than we might think. In particular, what I'm going to talk about are some of these analogies in which one has a completely different system from a gravitational system. And one wants to look at that, and one finds that it also has a temperature for the ra same reason as Hawking showed that black holes to. And so can we use these analogies to try and understand the gravitational system? Analogies, of course, are ancient. The Greeks were arguing from analogy already. And in how far, it raises the question, how far, if you have an analogy between two systems, A and B, 
and you find some feature of system B, in how far can you then say system A has got that same feature? Well, one of the problems always with analogies is no analogy is exact. Because if they were exact, it would be the same system. So there have to be some differences between them. So given that, how much can we rely on that analogy? And especially if that analogy is a mathematical analogy rather than just a physical analogy. Well, let's go back to 1974 after Jacob had predicted that black holes have to have an entropy and suggesting that this entropy was proportional to the surface area of a black hole. Why? Because Hawking had just proven in 72 or 71 or 72 that the size of the black hole, namely the surface area of the black hole, always must increase. Entropy must always increase. This almost must increase. They must be the same thing. As an analogous statement, you sort of feel a little bit uncomfortable with it, in particular because that meant that you had to have a temperature. And lo and behold, when Hawking went ahead and did the calculation of a quantum field in the vicinity of one of these black holes, he found that the black hole sort of acts like an amplifier, a very weird kind of amplifier. And we know that any amplifier has to have quantum noise. And black holes have quantum noise that is exactly thermal, where the temperature is proportional to 1 over the mass of the black hole. Uh, this temperature isn't high. A solar mass black hole would have a temperature of about 10 to the minus 5 or 10 to the minus 6 Kelvin, which of course is absolutely impossible to see against the whole sky background, which has a temperature of 3 degrees Kelvin. So there's just no way, and since you know, black holes smaller than the, sun, uh, the mass of the sun are pretty hard to find, there's just no possibility of seeing these out there. This also produces an entropy, as I've said. The problem, one of the problems with Hawking's derivation is that if you look at it, it really makes no physical sense. It's perfectly good mathematical. The mathematics is nothing wrong with it. But physically, mm. why is it problematic? Well, here I've got a diagram. So up is supposed to be time. Uh, left and right is supposed to be space. Let's say the radius away from the black hole. Is that better? So left and right is supposed to be space. And what I've plotted here are light rays. So let's look at these light rays that are emitted late after the black hole has formed. Well, they're coming from the black hole. So I trace them back in time. They're, of course, traveling at the velocity of light out here. So they have, you know, as time goes on, they get farther and farther away. Let's go back. They've got to get closer and closer. But they can't come from within the black hole, because nothing can come out of a black hole. So what has to happen to these light rays is they get squeezed up against the horizon. They get squeezed very rapidly. Every 10 to the minus 5 seconds or so, they get half as close to the horizon once again as they did before. Well, if the black hole lives for some time, let's say one second, <coughs> that squeezing means that the wavelength has gotten squeezed by a factor of something like e to the 10 to the fifth. Now, e to the 10 to the fifth is a very big number. It's a very, very, very big number in that I don't ever have to worry about units for this thing anymore. Because whether or not I choose my units to be 
uh, centimeters or diameters of the universe or Planck scale, which is 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, one over to one divide, you know, with 33 zeros following it. All that does is make a change in that factor of 10 to the fifth by some tiny little amount. In other words, it's still e to the 10 to the fifth, no matter what units I use. It's such a big number. So what this says is that the radiation, the thermal emission that Hawking predicted, which comes out of the black hole, originated from quantum fluctuations before the black hole formed of wavelength e to the minus 10 to the fifth. Well, at that kind of wavelength, one no longer believes one's theory anymore. If one takes a fluctuation of that kind of a wavelength and ask what's the energy of that fluctuation, it's e to the 10 to the fifth, i.e. it's e to the 10 to the fifth times the mass of the whole universe. And so you've got something here which has e to the 10 to the fifth times the mass of the whole universe wandering up to this little tiny black hole which has only got the mass of the sun, only, got the mass of the sun, it would completely dominate everything and one simply wouldn't believe the physics that one used to derive anything with respect to it anymore. Of course, if we could do experiments and we actually saw this emission from a black hole, we'd know that everything was okay. But as I mentioned, that's pretty hard to do. And small black holes are really, really hard to find. Well, let's go to something else. Back in 1972, I was asked, I was a postdoc of Roger Penrose's at the time in London, and Dennis Schaum asked me to come to Oxford to give a cloakroom on black holes, and I was trying to think how I could explain black holes to people. And the analogy I came up with was, let's imagine we have a waterfall. And it's a particularly virulent waterfall, such that at this point, the velocity of the water is, fa oops, is faster than the velocity of sound, just at that red line. Well, now we imagine that we have some very intelligent fish. For example, these are fish in uh, Terry Pratchett's Discworld. I don't know how many of you read Terry Pratchett. <laughs> Those of you that haven't, you should read it. It's great. <laughs> Any Discworld is this place where magic instead of physics rules, um, etc. But anyway, these are some strange beings called physicist fish. And they're trying to investigate the big waterfall at the edge of the world uh, that occurs there. He has a flat world with water in it, and the water falls over the edge. When asked, how does the water get back to replenish itself, he says, it's accomplished. And that was it. Um, and these physicists are examining it, and you have this professor fish over here who sends a student near this waterfall. By the way, these little protuberances here are not fins, they're ears. Because these are blind fish and they only experience the world through sound. Now what happens when this poor little graduate student gets too close to this surface where the velocity of sound equals the velocity of the fluid? Well, if he gets inside there, the sound can't get out because the water sweeps it over much faster than it can climb out. If you think about what happens very close to that region, it takes a long time, exponentially long time, for the sound to get out. So as that graduate student falls in, he thinks he's saying, help! And all his professor hears is, help! Because the sound, each wave of the sound takes longer and longer to get out. 
it's a longer and longer wavelength, so therefore its frequency is lower and lower, and the sound is base shifted away before the fish falls over the waterfall. This is exactly what happens in a black hole for light. Something falls into a black hole, the light is redshifted very rapidly so that you never ever uh, can see something coming from inside the black hole. Uh, of course, it's not clear that even if the professor had heard the graduate student saying help, he would have done anything, but that's a usual problem between professors and graduate students. Not here? Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, a few years later, I was teaching a course in fluid mechanics, and my mind wandered one day when I was looking at the equations for fluid mechanics, and I decided to try and do a calculation to ask what would actually happen with these sound waves in this kind of a situation. And what I discovered is that the sound waves can be written in a form in which they're absolutely identical to the to light, the waves equations for light traveling around a black hole. I've gone through some of the calculations here, but let me not do that. So they, uh, uh, they obey exactly the same equations that Hawking used in deriving the temperature of a black hole. And uh, if you go through his calculations step by step for these sound waves, one again gets a temperature. The temperature in this case is not equal to the mass. There's not no definition of the mass. But there it's determined by the rate at which the fluid is flowing through that horizon. The derivative of the flow of the fluid through that horizon, which is the point where the velocity of sound equals the velocity of light. You get an equation that looks like this, namely that the temperature is proportional to the uh, derivative in space of the velocity of sound, which is c minus the velocity of the fluid. Well, that difference is equal to zero right at the horizon, uh, but its derivative isn't zero, divided by c again. This is not a very uh, big temperature. If one does the hydrodynamic approximation, in other words, one assumes that the equations of hydrodynamics are exactly what one should use, one gets exactly the same problem as one does for black holes. You get this e to the 10 to the fifth problem, where it makes no sense. But fortunately, in this case, one knows what actually happens with fluids when one looks at a small enough scale, you start to see atoms. Yes? Where is H bar coming from? Well, it's the same, it comes from exactly the same place as it comes from in the Hawking one. Namely, I'm quantizing these sound waves, phonons, and it's the amplification of the zero point fluctuations of the phonons that produces the, uh, the thermal radiation. So one does have to have quantum mechanics to get the H bar, and that quantum mechanics is coming because I'm, doing, I'm looking at these quantized sound waves, which are just phonons, which one does all of the time. As a result of this, I published this paper. And the most important thing about this paper I want you to notice is this one little letter here, the question mark. I had immense trouble getting that through the editors because they do not like questions in their question marks in their titles. But I finally convinced them that this was a genuine question mark. I did not know whether maybe one could use these ideas to do experiments to actually test this thermal radiation being given off by one of these horizons. Now this applies to all kinds of situations, not just water, 
You could also look at liquid hydrogen, for example, or liquid helium, for example. Uh, <coughs> if one looks at liquid helium, one finds that instead of having a constant velocity of sound, which would be just a straight line, the uh, so-called dispersion relationship, the relationship between the frequency and the wave number for liquid helium, has this kind of weird functional dependence. Ah. Has this kind of weird functional dependence. What that means is that at high frequencies, the velocity of sound is no longer a constant. And it was Ted Jacobson that realized that this was a crucial feature about the behavior of sound in any kind of material, is that the atomic nature changes the dispersion relationship of the sound. Bose-Einstein condensates have a similar kind of dispersion relation, only except instead of falling over, they keep increasing. The dispersion relationship goes as omega is proportional to k, to omega is proportional to k squared. And many other materials one can do the same kind of thing for. So we have these analogies now, a whole bunch of analogies. Waves and fluids, surface waves and fluids, electromagnetic waves and waveguides, etc. All of those we could imagine trying to do experiments with. They all obey the same equations as Hawking's at low frequencies, and they all obey different equations at high frequencies. So one can use them to test whether or not the Hawking radiation really does depend on that high frequency behavior or not. Well, one idea that Ralph Schutzold and I came up with was using surface waves and water. For water waves, if one looks at uh, waves uh, whose wavelength is longer than the depth of the fluid, you find that you get exactly the same kind of dispersion relationship as one would expect for um, light around a black hole. As the waves get shorter and shorter, so the wavelength is less than the depth of the water, uh, at that point, the dispersion relationship falls over, just as it does for liquid helium. So one could try and do experiments just with a big tank of water, which you had, where you had the water flowing in such a way that at some point the velocity of the water was faster than the velocity of these surface waves, and ask whether or not that would work. And in, uh, about eight years ago, a group of us at UBC, primarily led by Silke Weinfurtner, who was then a postdoc, Ted Tedford was a postdoc from civil engineering, uh, Matt Penrice was an undergraduate student, I was a professor in physics, and Greg Lawrence was a professor over in civil engineering. They were extremely important because they had these equipment already. They had these long flumes, these long tanks, in which one could set these waves going and have the water flowing through the flumes. So this is a sketch of what the, di what the experiment looks like. One has a long tank in which water is flowing. There is a pump down here. Come on, there it is. That's a pump which pumps water from a reservoir up through here. There's a bunch of screens here to smooth out the flow of the water. There's a little airplane wing kind of thing sitting in here. The exact shape was a Darwinian uh, evolution of us trying to find the best shape to do the uh, experiment with, so there's nothing uh, particularly uh, necessary about the exact form of this. The water flows over that, and of course as the water flows over that, it has to go faster, because there's a smaller area through which the water can flow, and the same amount of water has to flow over the top as in the other places, so it has to flow faster over the top there. 
And then here we have a little engine which produces waves which travel back towards this thing and then eventually fall back down into this tank. I love this diagram because you could imagine running across that diagram in a textbook from the late 1800s. You know, you could imagine Kelvin having this diagram in one of his things. So it's nice that one can do an experiment, you know, a hundred year old experiment, and get some insight into what black holes are all about. This is, of course, where we do a little bit of modern stuff to figure out what the height of the water is. Uh, Ted Tedford had, in fact, designed something like this for his PhD uh, for a totally different process. So what one does is one fills the water with rhodamine dye, which is a dye that absorbs green light and emits pink light, a whole broad spectrum of light down towards the red. It absorbs so strongly that the green light gets into the water less than a millimeter. So by just taking a picture of the side, one can see exactly where the surface of the water is without disturbing the flow of the water. I mean, one idea was to put the needles in there and use capacitive or resistive techniques to try and figure out exactly how deep those needles are in the water, etc. But of course, that would disturb the flow of the water. This doesn't. Pardon? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things, if one didn't have the rhodamine dye in there, the laser, of course, would just specularly reflect or refract at the surface, and you'd never see it in the camera on the side. But because of the uh, fluorescence, you do. And that fluorescence also kills the speckle pattern in the laser light. <coughs> so it's got huge advantages, the rhodamine dye. Well, this is a number of scans, a number of experiments that we carried out. This is the Fourier transform of the waves on the surface. Uh, it's a Fourier transform in time, and the time Fourier transform is linked exactly to the frequency of the wave generation, so that one looks at the wave generation at that, exactly that frequency, and one gets curves like this. If one goes off of that frequency only a tiny amount, one gets this red curve down here. In other words, there's no signal. So doing this linking of the temporal frequency to the generation frequency is really good. And this indicates that there's very little noise coming about from that uh, source. This peak in here is the incoming wave these peaks over here turn out to be what are called the positive and negative norm of the waves that are given off. And the intensity of this, wa of this wave over this wave tells you how many particles would be created if one could see the quantum noise. It's basically this wave on the left, this peak on the left, is the so-called stimulated emission that Einstein talked about in his paper on A and B coefficients. So by looking at the ratio of these two, we can figure out what the spontaneous emission would be if one could see the quantum noise, just using Einstein's 1919 paper. And that's what we got. That's those ratios plotted as a function of frequency. And if the quantum noise gives a thermal spectrum, that should be a straight line. Well, the straight line there is, of course, a best fit. But I think you'll agree that the data points really do lie on a straight line very well. It's thermal. Of course, this is not a quantum experiment. If one tried to look at the quantum effect, and ask what's the temperature of this radiation that would be given off. Well, the frequencies we're talking about here are hertz. So the temperature is of the order of 10 to the minus 12 Kelvin. The 
problem is water in Vancouver, at least, is a little bit warmer than that. Or I should say, even in Vancouver. Even in Winnipeg. Can one observe quantum radiation directly, either the thermal or the quantum? Well, if one looks at a Bose-Einstein condensate, for example, and one writes down the standard approximation as to how a Bose-Einstein <laughs> condensate behaves, this is something called oops, the gross pietevsky equation. This uh, microphone needs a better spring on it. Uh, the gross pietevsky equation, which one can write in exactly the fluid form. In other words, this looks, the sound waves in a Bose-Einstein condensate are exactly the sound waves that one might expect in a, in, a, in a fluid. There's a little change which changes the dispersion relationship at high frequency, something that's this term over here, which is sometimes called the quantum pressure. And all it does is basically change the dispersion relationship at high frequencies. So this quantum pressure alters the dispersion relationship such that at higher frequencies, omega is proportional to k squared instead of proportional to k as it should be for light near a black hole, for example. Jeff Steinhauer, a year and a half ago, is it now? Uh, did an experiment in which he created a waterfall of this Bose-Einstein condensate by shining an, an intense laser beam on a very, very long Bose-Einstein condensate. It's set up such that the uh, atoms in the laser beam are attracted, uh, have lower energy, get attracted into this region. So you get a waterfall basically formed just along this point. And by making the light strong enough, you can actually make that waterfall flow faster than the velocity of sound. Of course, the velocity of sound in a Bose-Einstein condensate is of the order of millimeters per second. It's not 300 kilometers per, or three kilometers per second. Yeah, three kilometers per second as it is in, uh, in water, for example. So one could do the experiment more easily. It's, of course, fortunate because this whole length of the Bose-Einstein condensate is less than a millimeter. So if the water flowed very much faster, it would be almost impossible to the, do the experiment in the lab. You couldn't build it big enough. Anyway, let's go quickly through. What he does is to measure by using interferometry. This isn't exactly the way he does it, uh, but he uses interferometry to measure the density of the Bose-Einstein condensate and gets a map of the densities at some particular point as the water flows over this geometry and looks at those fluctuations in the density. This is a graph from his paper of those density fluctuations. And this is with that intense laser beam that produces the waterfall. You can see that the water must be flowing much more rapidly here than it is over here. Well, it's actually at rest over here. It's flowing away over here. And this is where the waterfall is. To see it as a waterfall, you should go into the frame in which that laser beam is at rest. And this Bose-Einstein condensate is moving into the frame with uh, the velocity that that laser beam had uh, originally. The lower curve is just the uh, density if you don't have that laser beam in there where you get no waterfall at all. This is the kind of results that he gets. One of the key things here is it's noisy. So one of the, everything's still working out. Yeah, this just went off here. so. Now, what was, does one expect for a situation like this? Well, it turns out that just like for black holes, if you look at the quantum creation right near the horizon of the black hole, you find that at low frequencies, 
the radiation gets reflected back in. It can't escape. There's a potential barrier just near the black hole around one and a half times the diameter of the, or the radius of the black hole. There's this potential barrier which reflects back the radiation at low frequencies. And that's what you seem to get here as well. Because if you look at um, a quantity which uh, measures the sort of quantumness of the system, you find that at intermediate frequencies, you see something that looks like quantum entanglement. At low frequencies, you see none of it. That still needs to be looked into in more depth, uh, but it's at least very suggestive that what he is seeing is real quantum stuff. Now, his system is too noisy to see the thermal spectrum. And that, one hopes, will get solved with many more experiments and in the future that one can directly see the thermal spectrum. But right now, as far as I know, and he can tell us better later if that's not true, but it seems to be quantum. So looking at the water system, that's thermal, but not quantum. This is quantum, but who knows about the thermality? Combine them together, you have quantum thermal radiation in these fluids. Of course, they're very different experiments, and you sort of, well, can you really combine them? Well, once proven both pieces, eventually one would like to prove both of them at the same time, of course. So, we have an analogy here to Hawking's thermal radiation. Does this tell us that Hawking radiation actually occurs? In how far can we trust this analogy? It certainly, at least for me, gives me some faith that A, Hawking's calculation is correct, but B, that it doesn't depend on that stupid ultra-high frequency stuff that you get in Hawking's calculation. Hawking's calculation says I have to believe the theory at e to the 10 to the fifth, at which point I don't believe the theory at all. In both of these systems, that e to the 10 to the fifth never enters because of the change in the dispersion relation, the wavelengths in the water system are always longer than a couple of centimeters. In this Bose-Einstein condensates, they're longer than the spacing between the atoms, which is you know, of the order of uh, tenths of microns or something like that. Uh, so in both of these cases, one gets a cutoff. And despite that cutoff, we still get the same result. So that tells us that perhaps the Hawking effect has absolutely nothing to do with those high frequencies, despite the fact that you, Hawking absolutely needed them in order to derive his result. So that gives one a lot more faith that Hawking's calculation is not physically stupid, that it really does give us some indicate, some. Uh, calculation of a genuine physical effect, which is nice. Uh, so I'm just pointing out here that you know, one, would like, one would like a system which is in which all of the quantum effects and the thermal radiation were also visible. Uh, one of the possibilities, for example, is to do an optical experiment. One can change the refractive index of materials by shining in a, a sufficiently strong laser beam. And if you go into the frame of that moving pulse of intense radiation, it look, you can make it look exactly like a black hole, white hole pair is occurring there. Um, and people have tried that. Um, the group around um, Daniel Faccio thought that they had it, 
The problem was that they were operating, they were shining a laser into glass. The trouble is that they had to operate so close to the uh, region in which that glass starts to uh, get destroyed. In other words, if they doubled the intensity of their laser beam, you could actually hear the laser beam going through the glass. And if you looked at the glass, you would see this streak of brown dots where the laser beam had destroyed the structure in the glass. So at that point, one starts to get very uncomfortable that perhaps these intense laser beams are, um, you know, what you're seeing is not any kind of quantum effects from the horizon, but is coming about due to this horrible nonlinearities as the glass is being destroyed. Now, this is all very nice. It, of course, says absolutely nothing about entropy. Because the thing about the waterfall analogy is that you have a temperature, but you don't have that that temperature is a function of the energy, which is what you have in black holes, which is why you can talk about the entropy. It would be really, really nice to find an ana analog system in which one could really talk about the entropy as well. But I haven't been able to come up with one yet. We've got a bunch of very bright students here. That's a job for you to do. One can do the same kind of thing in all kinds of other situations. Inflationary cosmology says that the fluctuations that create the, uh, the uh, galaxies and so forth that we see around us come from quantum fluctuations in the early universe. One can imagine doing experiments in that kind of a system. And people, in fact, have done something like that where they uh, look at systems in which you're effectively setting up a cosmology and you see the amplification of the quantum fluctuations, which is similar in many ways to the, um, the generation of structure within our universe. One can also think about looking at the Penrose process. The Penrose process is if you have a rotating black hole, you can actually extract energy, some of that rotational energy, just by shining waves on it. Now, a black hole you, you think of as an absorber. Here you shine light on the black hole, and what comes out is a higher intensity than what you shone in. You know, it's an absorptive thing, and you get more energy out, even though it's absorptive, than you actually fed in. And uh, this is just from Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler about the Penrose process. And Silke Weinfurtner has done experiments where you have a vortex in water, you shine wa sound, you shine, uh, sorry, you send surface waves in water at that, and you find that the amplitude coming back is higher than the amplitude uh, that you originally sent in. So one has actually seen this kind of Penrose process going on in rotating water, which is very much like a rotating black hole. So I hope that what I've given you is a little bit of a feeling as to how one might actually be able, able to do experiments in the lab which cast light on how black holes form. Certainly I, and I think Jacob, back in the 1970s, had absolutely no feeling that it might actually be possible to make this all into an experimental uh, subject. I mean, certainly I felt very much like, well, phew, I don't have to worry about anybody ever applying any of the stuff that I'm working on. It's all so much out there, there's just, just no way you could ever do experiments on it. It doesn't seem to be true. It seems that we can do experiments which really elucidate what's happening around black holes in their quantum situation. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. And now that you've shown the talk over there, let's see if there are any reflections there. Okay, I hope more than what I sent out. <laughs> yes. First of all, thank you very much for honoring Jacob, who was also a good friend of mine and a mentor. Uh, uh, secondly, I think that the more troubling aspect is the actual mechanism. Because gravity is not quantized, so the mechanism that would ultimately couple the gravitational energy via the einstein tensor representations to uh, this radiation is, is I think, the, the more fundamental aspect, which is not being addressed at all <coughs> in the analogies. And well, so what would seed this quantized thermal radiation, and what exactly would be the ultimate rate? And I think Hawking's calculation really uh, tries to delve into that, but fails for the exact reasons you said. Well, certainly water is a quantum fluid. Water is defined by its, the quantum mechanics of all of these little atoms. In fact, when I originally published that paper, I wanted to think about, you know, how does quantum mechanics come into this? And one of my problems was that I foresaw myself having to solve the Schrodinger equation for 10 to the third strongly interacting atoms, which was completely and utterly beyond my ability to do. And it was um, Ted Jacobson that really realized that the essential thing that the atomic nature of matter does is to just change the dispersion relation. And once one had that, one still has a linear theory, and one can do the calculations without very much trouble whatsoever. So what that indicates is that it's not really this sort of quantum mechanics. It's not the way in which the hydrogen and uh, oxygen atoms interact with each other in the water that is producing the radiation that Hawking is talking about. It's some very, very elementary features of that interaction, in this case just changing the dispersion relation, that is producing that radiation. Now, you need to seed an instability. That's pardon? You need to seed an instability. Well, it's not really even an instability. It turns out that one can also make an analogy between this and an ordinary amplifier, like the amplifier in your hi-fi system, right? As House and Mullen already in the 1950s showed, that any time you have an amplifier, even if you cool everything down to zero Kelvin, so there's no other noise coming into the system, it will always produce noise. Because it's seeded by quantum fluctuations. Because it's seeded by quantum fluctuations. But all you need there are the quantum, as the linear amplifier, so the amplifier is linear, those quantum fluctuations come out, and you get quantum noise coming uh, out the other end. And that's all that's happening in the black hole is the black hole is being seeded by quantum fluctuations. And what comes out is this thermal radiation coming out the other end. Uh, because of the peculiar nature of, of uh, the amplifier that is the black hole, that spectrum of the quantum fluctuations is exactly thermal all across all frequencies. Usually, uh, frequency by frequency in an amplifier, it looks thermal, but the temperature is completely different depending on what frequency you look at. Here, you get exactly the same temperature at all frequencies, which is, which is what makes black holes so unusual. The other thing about black holes is that they do this frequency downshifting. In other words, it's not the energy that's being amplified. The am energy is, in fact, very, very strongly de-amplified. You know, these initial fluctuations, which had a very, very high frequency, i.e. a high energy, come out as low frequency. But it's the amplitude that gets amplified, and it turns out the amplitude is what's important, not the energy. And that produces a thermal spectrum coming out. So all of this sort of gives one at least some hints as to what's going on in black holes. What one would like, then, is to have a derivation of the Hawking result which made completely clear that the high frequency stuff is irrelevant. Unfortunately, what we have is Hawking's derivation, and we don't have a good derivation which makes absolutely clear that all of that high frequency stuff is irrelevant. 
Now, I've got, you know, I've had, and other people have had some ideas on this adiabatic amplification that, you know, these high frequency things see the black hole as being a very slowly varying thing. So they get adiab adiabatically brought down in energy. And you know from the adiabatic theorem that if the things happen slowly enough, it always stays in the same state. It always stays in the vacuum state. So there's a, there are stories that one can tell with sufficient hand waving, which make it not completely absurd that this happens. But that, you know, hand waving stories are not the same as real good calculations. So one would like to be able to do the calculation in such a way that that made it obvious that the high frequency stuff was irrelevant. And that we still really need. Um, so I hope, and none of this really has much to do with quantum gravity. There are, of course, questions that arise um, in this situation. Uh, for example, could quantum gravity destroy this effect? You know, people have argued, look, quantum gravity, the horizon isn't going to be just sitting there, it's going to fluctuate. Could that fluctuation in the horizon actually destroy this effect? Well, one has a fluid, you know, a BC or water. You've got all those atoms. Exactly where is the sonic horizon? At low frequencies, one can say, OK, it's right there. But obviously, as you go up in frequency, where the horizon is becomes you know, just as unknown as it does in the case of, uh, of black holes. So could one take the uh, you know, systems like Bose-Einstein condensates? Or let's say liquid helium. You know in liquid helium that the initial fluctuations, if you set things up correctly, can come from the regime in which the dispersion relation of liquid helium just falls apart. You get massive fluctuations. You know, once you get to the atomic wavelengths of the size of the atomic separation, you just don't really have a dispersion relationship anymore. There's just a mess there. And you get absorption and all of this stuff. Could that destroy the effect? And if it doesn't, why? So there are lots of things that one can use the analogy to answer some of the questions that naturally come up in the uh, black hole case, where, since we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, it becomes really, really hard to, um, to answer the question, because we don't have a theory in, which we, in terms of which we can answer the question. OK, let's try to a few more questions. Uh, OK. So yes. Who are you pointing at? Okay. Regarding uh, analogous physical systems versus uh, computer simulation. Right. Uh, one advantage could obviously be that if you're simulating in a computer the relevant hydrodynamic equations, you wouldn't get the uh, microscopic uh, interatom coarse graining. Thank you. Um, could you touch on other advantages of physical analogies versus simulation? I mean, one of the problems with doing it in computers is you really want to do the quantum. And the problem with quantum on the computer is it becomes immediately hopeless. Once you get more than, you know, 10 to the 20, or once, sorry, once you get more than about 20 atoms, the size of the Hilbert space is just so huge you can't fit it into any computer, or even all the computers that we have in the world right now. And we want 10 to the 20 of them. So. Ultimately, doing the real quantum calculations, computers are no more help than you know, analytic calculations are. One is going to have to figure out approximation schemes and have some faith in those approximation schemes um, in getting the results. Uh, but yeah, I mean, finding more analogies would be really, really nice. You know, people have worked on this. As I said, there are these, all these systems in which one has looked. But, you know, how can we better do the calculations so that we've got more faith that what we're capturing all of the relevant physics, you know, instead of only just some of it? In other words, I think the computer simulation is only as good as the equations you can put into it, and in this case. Well, I mean, computers are a way of solving equations. 
Uh, you know, that's basically what they are. Analytic techniques are ways of solving equations. Computers are ways of solving equations, uh, which should be very, you know, in a sense, they're just another tool. Just as the Greeks, when they did physics, used just geometry. Think of proving Pythagoras' theorem with only geometry. Not any algebra whatsoever, just geometry. Or proving that the square root of 2 is rational, irrational, using only geometry. Triangles, right angles, stuff like that. They had immense power. But of course, in the, 15th, in the 16th century, with the development of algebra, we suddenly had a far more types of techniques that we could then apply to the system. Computers are another set of techniques that we've developed in the last century that we can apply to systems and get solutions where we just couldn't, where we hopelessly could do it just by doing algebra. Uh, but, you know, and so that's going to, that's going to help solving a lot of these problems, but it's going to run into limits as well eventually. Let me take one last question. Sure. One last question. Somebody okay. up there had a question. Yes. Well. Yes. Okay. I just want to follow your argument. I mean, in the, ana in the, in the analogies, you, you managed to avoid the problem with the exponent 10 to the 5 by changing the dispersion relation. Yes. But can you go back to the derivation of Hawking and show the point where that indeed the dispersion relation in his case needs to be ch is changing accordingly? As I said, that's really one of the open questions that, that needs to be done. In the gravitational case, what happens? I mean, obviously, e to the 10 to the fifth is absurd. OK, so that can't be the right answer. But what is the right answer in that case? We don't have a good, good clue to yet. What the anal analog, an analog system suggests is that it doesn't really matter. Do something up there which gives us some sort of cutoff. And what that's going to do is nothing. That you will still get the same Hawking radiation coming out to, no matter what happens up at those high frequencies. That's the suggestion that we get from the analog. Yeah, but you need to show it in this case. Of course. Of course. Of course, that's what you would like to do. And we don't know how to do that yet. And that's why I said, there are a bunch of bright students here. Do it. OK, thank you very much. Pardon?